Okay, good morning, everyone. And welcome to this special edition of the Coffee Microcaps Morning Meeting. This is indeed the 40th Coffee Microcaps Morning Meeting that we have ran over the last uh, 12 months. And uh, since it matches my age, I said we'd do a special edition. And instead of having two companies in, we would have four companies presenting this morning. Um, for anybody who's joining us for the first time, my name is Mark Tobin. I'm the founder of Coffee Microcaps quick uh, couple of housekeeping slides and then we're going to get straight into it uh, with our first presenter this morning. Um, for anyone, as I said, joining us for the first time, we generally have companies on here that are under 300 million in market cap that are in revenue and approaching cash flow break even are indeed already profitable. We tend to have companies from outside the resources in the biotech sector, what I call industrial microcaps, but that spans quite a broad array of sectors for everything from technology to healthcare to media to niche retailers. Uh, it's, it's a diverse mix you, you'll find at these events. Uh, normally we'd have two companies presenting roughly every fortnight but more recently we've been doing them weekly as this is a special edition we have four companies presenting this morning over the uh, space of two hours uh, each company this morning uh, as we would normally have has a 30 minute slot broken down into roughly a 20 minute prezzo and then 10 minutes of Q&A at the end. If you do have any questions for the presenters, please type them in the Q&A box rather than in the chat function. Just makes it much easier for me to moderate the questions to our presenters at the end. Uh, please note the webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel. So if you can't stay for all the presentations, um, it will be up on the YouTube channel um, tomorrow morning. Uh, you can follow Coffee Microcaps on Twitter, YouTube for the recording of this webinar and indeed the other 39 we've had in the series along with a few other events that we've done in the last 12 to 18 months, LinkedIn for some additional long form content. I also write a weekly paid subscription newsletter where I profile one interesting microcap stock every week and you can get that on the Substack newsletter platform. Uh, we'll quickly be handing over to David Groberman, CEO of Heramed. Uh, after that, we are going to cross to Bo Bertoli, co-founder and chief revenue officer at Prosper Group. After that, then we will be handing to Sharif Elson Ari, MD at DropSuite. And then finally, we've got Bernard Wilson, CEO of Cash Rewards. So without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I know David is patiently waiting for us over in Israel. Uh, if you just want to go to full screen mode or slideshow mode. Yep, there we go, David. Perfect. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, really exciting to participate here for the first time. So good morning, everyone. Thank you for taking the time. It's really early here in beautiful Israel. It's 2 a.m. Um, a few quick words about myself before we really jump into the uh, company and presentation. I'm a medical engineer by training with backgrounds in mechanical, biomedical, and software engineering. Before becoming one of the uh, founders and the CEO of the company, I've spent about 15 years developing multidisciplinary uh, medical technologies for some of the leading companies uh, in the world such as Philips, GE, uh, Medtronic, Bayer, um, and many others. So with your permission, let's just uh, start with a snapshot of the company. We are an innovative medical data and technology company uh, providing home monitoring and telehealth solutions specifically designed for maternity and pregnancy. Now, our main goal is to achieve uh, what is called the triple golden aim of one, improving patient and doctor satisfaction, two, delivering better care and better clinical outcomes, and three, provide a cost-effective solution that is accessible to practically every expecting mother out there. Now, at the core of our solution, we have the Hera Beat, the device that you can see in the middle of the center here, of the screen here. 
Um, it's our proprietary medical device. It's a smart connected pregnancy monitor that is optimized for home use, really the first of its kind in the world. The device, the Herabit, is clinically and scientifically validated and has regulatory approvals across the world, PGA in Australia, CE in Europe uh, by BSI, and FDA 510K in the US. The device delivers medical grade accuracy, monitoring the fetal and maternal heart rates, which is the gold standard and the most crucial measurement that is required to assess the health of the pregnancy and the well being of the baby. Now, it's all can be done uh, at the comfort of the home. And by that, we enable for the first time medical level virtual remote pregnancy care. Now, our HeraCare platform is a full blown digital maternity management solution connecting the HeraBeat as well as additional uh, smart medical devices and linking the expecting mothers with their care provider. Our business model involves a one-time hardware fee of between 200 to 300 US dollars for the devices, followed by a software as a service of approximately $50 US per user per month recurring revenue. The company is currently at what we call the commercial tipping point stage. We've recently announced two strategic paid pilots in Australia and in the US. These are just the first agreement under our business to business to consumer strategic direction. And we expect much more in the near future. Now, let me share a bit of a background about our domain and, and our sector. While we saw other areas in the health uh, sector rapidly growing and adapting telehealth and remote monitoring solutions, pregnancy, which is a massive market, with such a strong potential was, to be honest, dragging behind. Now, this is mainly due to the lack of technologies to enable a reliable solution to track and monitor the key vitals that are crucial for a genuine medical assessment of the health of the pregnancy. Now, on top of that, currently, the basic standard of care is still very much visit-centric. It's periodic, it's passive, and it's putting the doctor in the center. Well, what we offer is what the market really wants, the pregnant moms and even the doctors, a solution that is home-based and patient-centric, putting the mother in the center and provides a continuous data to deliver a personalized and proactive care. Now, the global medical standards recommend about 14, one, four in-person clinic visits, which creates a significant challenge for both doctors and pregnant women. And this is just for normal, normal low-risk pregnancies, while in high-risk, which today stands for about 15 to 20% of the pregnancies, it is much higher and can be as much as 30, even 40 visits per pregnancy. So just think about how much time women and their partners spend for driving, parking, waiting in line, and then waiting for the results, and how much space clinics and hospitals need to allocate to conduct these visits how much time and attention is required from the medical staff to care for these women on site. All this time and money can potentially be saved if they will be able to do that the vast majority of these measurements at home safely and accurately and seamlessly share it with their care providers. Now it is a consensus across all stakeholders that COVID forced the industry to move dramatically to remote and telehealth solutions. And now that everybody got comfortable with using telehealth technologies and witnessed all the benefits and how effective it is, there is no going back, which obviously creates a significant tailwind to our business model and unique offering. Now I'll spend a moment now explaining um, the combined end-to-end -end platform which we're providing. The Hera Beat is our proprietary multi-sensor device. It's a smart and sophisticated handheld device that enables the untrained expecting mothers to monitor their baby's heart rate and well-being and share the data in real time with their doctors. The Hera Care is a comprehensive digital pregnancy management platform connecting additional smart medical devices and linking the expecting mothers with their care providers. 
enabling a personalized experience and remotely medically supervised pregnancy management. Now this at home pregnancy care solution represents a business to business to consumer model, enabling clinics, hospitals, insurance companies, and digital health platforms to provide a completely new telehealth solution for pregnancy. I want to drill even further to the HeraCare software as a service platform. We can see how it is seamlessly connecting the home users, the expecting moms, with their care managers and doctors. On the left side, you can find the patient-facing mobile application that connects wirelessly to a variety of smart medical devices and screening tools. The app is designed to help the expecting mother to easily collect all the critical information that doctors need in order to ensure a healthy pregnancy. Now, on the other hand, on the right of the HeraCare platform, we have the care manager dashboard where midwives and doctors can view and manage their entire panel of patients from a single location. It enables for the first time a virtual prenatal care in a clinically safe and encrypted environment ensuring providers are well-informed and can optimize their workflows, reducing most of the visits to the clinic, saving time and saving money. I would like to emphasize that the solution is not in any way trying to replace the doctors. On the contrary, it's a tool that enables them to extend their services, optimize their procedures, so they are uh, able to make medical decisions that are much more knowledgeable and based on the most relevant and accurate data. We have a well-defined commercialization strategy. And as I mentioned earlier, we have recently demonstrated improving momentum in the validation and execution of that strategy. There are four basic steps to success. First, we focus on establishing a clinical credibility of the technology. Now this is already done and completed with the medical partnership that we have around the world. Second, we progress to a stage of paid pilots with leading healthcare providers. This stage is focused on making sure that the technology is integrated and aligned with the hospital's internal workflows and standards of care. Both Junaloop in Australia and Madnex in the US are currently in this stage. And I'm sure that it will soon evolve into a full-scale commercial rollout. There will be more in the near future. Now, the third step is then to be able to scale and enable broad adoption of potentially the entire audience of expecting mothers of each one of these accounts and partners. Practically, this stage is already in play. Now, the fourth stage is where we plan to execute a land and expand strategy across our main target markets, including Australia, US, Israel, and Europe, providing pathways to tens of thousands of births per annum, and then growing to hundreds of thousands of births. I would like to quickly share one of the most impressive milestones that we have recently achieved. We announced the results of an independent, comprehensive clinical study that was undertaken at the Junaloop Health Campus, part of Ramsey Health. During the trial, the Herabic device demonstrated hospital-grade accuracy for monitoring fetal and maternal heart rates, as well as excellent usability scores and user satisfaction for both use by the clinicians and the pregnant women. On April, followed the completion of the clinical trial, we were honored to have the trial peer reviewed and published on the Green Journal, which is ACOG, the American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, formal medical journal. I encourage all of you to review the publication as the facts and conclusions really are overwhelming. The chief editor of the journal, Dr. Rose, even chose our publication to be highlighted and featured, featured in the monthly webinar that he is leading. So you are also able, welcome to listen to how Dr. Rose is excited about our tech and how significant he thinks the potential is. Now, as I mentioned, we have recently announced two paid pilots with significant and strategic clients. 
The first was with Juno Loop Health Campus and incorporates a paid pilot of the comprehensive Hera Care solution. This is just the initial phase of what we believe and anticipate to soon become a full commercial rollout. Juno Loop, as you probably know, is part of Australia's largest private hospital operator, Ramsey Healthcare Group. Juno Loop is responsible for over 3,000 births annually, while Ramsey overall is responsible for approximately 25,000. Now, the second pilot is with US-based Obstetrics Medical Group, an affiliate of Mednex. Mednex is listed on the New York Stock Exchange with a market cap of over 2.5 billion US dollars. Mednex is the largest provider of women's and children's physician services in the US, and they provide vital care to one in four babies born in the US. Let me emphasize that it is over 1 million births per year. Now, the initial part of the agreement includes a paid pilot of 100 licenses for the HeraCare software and devices, including the HeraBeat, a smart scale, and a connected blood pressure. The pilot has been active for several weeks now, and I am extremely, extremely excited to share that the feedback from both mothers as well as medical professionals has been phenomenal. Generally speaking, we can already see behavioral change and a trend of adherence levels in which over 90% of the users are in full compliance of the care plan. We have already started to discuss the next steps and we are expecting to see significant progress in the near future. Now, the main goal of these pilots is to evaluate the functionality of the technology and the integration of the platform to Mednix's and Junaloop's workflows, care plans, and procedures and to make sure that the infrastructure is ready and stable while we are planning to enter into a wider deployment and scaled commercial implementation. Now, another two key partnerships that we have are the Mayo Clinic in the US and Sheba Medical Center in Israel. Mayo is also an equity partner and invested in the company. These are two of the world's top 10 hospitals and we are extremely proud to be working with both of them. So to summarize the business part, um, if we take an average of about $50 US per month per user, and let's use a conservative approach and, and, and estimate that our technology will be used for, let's say, 10 months each year. So we are talking about each license generating approximately $500 US per year as a recurring revenue on top of the $200 US one-time hardware fee. So let's take 1,000 licenses as, as an example. 1,000 licenses are therefore generating about 700,000 US dollars per year. Take five years, for example, and that's a classical $3 million contract. Now, 1,000 licenses, just to explain, represents to our best estimation a relatively small hospital while larger, while larger organizations will most probably need at least several thousands of licenses to be able to provide remote care for their entire audience of pregnant mothers, and even more than that. Our strategy is to focus commercial efforts on early adopters of telehealth in pregnancy, focused on demonstrating the unique advantages of offering a remote home-based maternity care model. We have multiple ways to generate revenue within each relationship, which offers us the flexibility to structure opportunities for each account and engagement. And we have several different potential clients and channel partners from hospitals and clinics to maternity health groups, digital health platforms, and insurance companies. Now to summarize, I wanna highlight where we stand today and why I'm very confident that HeraMed is on the path to becoming a market leader in enabling the adoption of telehealth in pregnancy. We have the only clinically validated maternity care platform. We have demonstrated its accuracy and satisfaction of both doctors and pregnant mothers. And we have the necessary regulatory approvals. The backdrop of COVID presented an opportunity to fast track telehealth adoption and created strong tailwinds across all stakeholders. 
We have paid pilots with two different global maternity care providers validating our commercial model and our B2B2C approach. And we have several other potential partnerships in the pipeline. And lastly, we have a strong and experienced management team and board, including our chairman, Dr. Ron Weinberger. And we are well-placed to capitalize on this significant opportunity. Thank you very much. I appreciate the invitation and happy to take any answer, any questions, sorry. Thanks, David. Uh, we actually had one or two questions emailed in ahead of time. So I'm just gonna quickly go to those um, while we're waiting for a question from the audience. One was around the hardware um, sales, Dave. I'm guessing this is uh, not generation one, but let's say generation one into the into the market. Uh, the question is around uh, how often do you see the hardware upgrade cycle? You know, are you planning on replacing the devices every three years? I think they're trying to figure out. You know, uh, the, you say a one-time hardware sale, but um, you know, new devices, improved devices. Uh, would probably come along at some point. Do, do you have an idea of, of the hardware replacement cycle? Okay, so I, I think I understand the question and let me try and answer that in uh, uh, two different approaches. So first of all, we already have devices um, in the market for approximately two years, even more than that with one specific client in Brazil. So we are very confident about the durability of the devices. And part of the business model is uh, focused on being able to refurbish the device and return it to circulation. So the uh, client, the hospital or the provider is paying an upfront fee of about 200 to 300 US dollars, as I mentioned. And by that, he is actually getting the hardware, the device itself which can then be refurbished uh, and used over and over again for what we believe will be at least five or six pregnancies across about three years. So on top of that, obviously, when you have the device and you are able to re easily refurbish the device and reuse it, then you have the recurring revenue uh, of the software as a service, which is a must in order for the device to operate uh, and be connected to the physician. Uh, of approximately $50 per month. Now, from a different angle, to answer your question, definitely, yes, that's the very improved and optimized first generation. We are definitely working on um, new generation of devices, uh, at least for the Hera Beat. It's not out there. It's still uh, under the radar but we are al already making some significant progress and we believe that in the uh, near future, we will be able to provide even more um, interesting devices to the market. And then another question was, um, with the UK being a significant market in Europe, although not in the EU anymore, what is the <laughs> regulatory pathway for Heramed into the UK market? Well, I have to say that's a very professional question. So um, the answer is that uh, indeed Brexit has happened, but from a regulatory perspective, the, uh, uh, the UK is currently still maintaining uh, and relying on the CE approvals. There is a relatively simple and short process, which we are currently going through of registering the technology with the local UK Ministry of Health, but all all the approvals, the tests, and the validations are relying on the CE approval. And with that, it, it probably worth mentioning that our notified body that gave us the CE approval is BSI, the British Standard Institute, which obviously is going to make our uh, path and, and life much easier. And we're definitely in Europe targeting today uh, the UK as one of the largest and uh, most promising markets. Uh, and then kind of one from one from me then, um, in terms of, I guess, advertising through the app and partnerships with, uh, I guess, some of the large FMCG guys like Unilever or Procter & Gamble, you know, you're, 
you're you have incredible access with this to first time parents, new parents, um, and indeed even uh, second, third time parents. Is that part of the strategy long term that you know there would be advertising to the uh, expectant parents? So I would have to say that at this point, we're really focused on the business to business channel in which we are partnering with hospitals and care providers. What we found is that it almost goes without saying, but once the expecting mom receives the recommendation from her physician to use the system, and he's actually the one that is responsible for providing the services and the care by using the system, there are no question asked. We've found zero, zero resistance until now from uh, pregnant moms because of this strategy of um, offering the devices and the technologies through her physician. Definitely, we see a lot of interest from uh, the big firms, uh, as well as, by the way, some pharma uh, companies. Uh, that are targeting uh, early uh, couples uh, and, and young couples early in life, uh, as well as pregnant women. Uh, but we believe that that's probably going to be the next stage after hospitals um, and care providers. Okay, and then just one from the audience, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know if whether you'll be able to, to answer. Oh, sorry, two from the audience. Let's take the first one anyway first. Um, assuming you move beyond the pilot stage to a full-on commercial agreement in either the markets, whether it's the, the Australian one or the, or the US one or the Israeli one. Um, how quickly can you scale up to, let's say, like 50,000 births per annum? I mean, have you got stock of the hardware devices ready to, ready to go? Or I think would be uh, the biggest limiting factor, I guess. Uh, I couldn't agree more. So look, first of all, obviously the software part is easily uh, scalable uh, and we're building the infrastructure in such a way that scale is, is easy um, and, and done at, at any uh, required uh, geography. We're based on AWS, uh, which makes life even, even uh, easier. Now, when it comes to the devices uh, and specifically the Hera Beat, uh, the answer is it's per demand and we're working very closely with our partners uh, in order to know in advance what the next quarter and the next quarter will look like. We definitely don't hold uh, thousands of devices as inventory. Uh, we're trying to manage and uh, balance our, our cash flow in the right way. We have the full infrastructure from the factory manufacturing side. We're currently manufacturing some of the components in China and the final assembly in Israel, but we also have partnerships with other factories uh, that will enable us to ramp up production uh, when there's a requirement. And we are definitely uh, looking forward and believe that such requirements will uh, happen in the near future. Okay, great. And the, I think, yeah, yeah this, uh, I think you've basically answered the second question through your comments uh, throughout this event. David, I think we're going to leave it there because I know our next presenters are up and uh, I can totally relay as a father of twins, the amount of uh, visits we had versus uh, some of our friends and family who are uh, single birth parents, uh, anything that can cut down the number of visits, uh, I would definitely be suggesting it to my wife. Thank you very much. Appreciate the feedback. Um, happy if anyone else have any questions to reach out offline and stay safe through the quarantine and all the other challenges. Really looking to a future in which we can uh, finally open the borders and uh, start meeting again, uh, person to person. Thank you very much. Thanks, David. And thanks for joining us uh, so late in the night or early in the morning there in Israel. <laughs> if you could please just stop sharing your screen and I can see Bo from Prosper is there. Bo, if you wanna start sharing your screen. 
we will get straight into the second presentation of the morning. Hi, it's Ross here. I'll, I'll oh, share Ross, the sorry. That's okay. Bo will Bo, Bo be talking very shortly. So I'll, uh, I'll bring the screen up. Okay. And uh, sorry, let's put it in presentation mode. Hopefully that works. Yeah. And yeah, if you just want to scroll back to the cover slide, right. Ross, that would be good. Okay, okay perfect. And, uh, sorry, I've just got to get it into the, the right um, presentational mode. Sorry, can. Um, I can see slide three currently, Ross. Can you? Yeah, unfortunately, I'm just sorry. I'm just going to reshare it because it's not coming up in the right way. Apologies. Okay. Okay. I see, okay. Bo is joining us now. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Hi, Bo. How are you? Ross is just getting the presentation set for us now. Um, excellent. Okay. Wonderful. All right, excellent. Good morning, everyone. Well, um, thanks once again for your time this morning. Um, my name is Bo Batali. I'm one of the co-founders and the Chief Revenue Officer at Prosper. Um, and I'm joined today um, here by Ross uh, Orcott, uh, who is our Chief Financial Officer. Um, the the, I guess the intent of, of this morning is really to share a bit about the background of, of Prosper, um, take you on a, a quick journey about who we are, where we've come from, um, and, and where we're going as a company, and also to, um, to provide a little bit more insight um, into you know, re really how we think and operate as a business. So um, uh, for those of you that, that aren't familiar with Prosper um, as a company, Prosper is now into its, its 10th year of operation. Um, we, we operate in the Australian and New Zealand markets and we are the leading online lender to small businesses. Um, small businesses uh, sit right across um, a whole range of different industries. Um, they really do show up in every pocket of, of the Australian economy. And we have a, a mission here at Prosper to really keep small businesses moving. We're, we're, we're building products and we're designing solutions and services um, that really support those small business owners to, to grow their business, to run their business and to make payments. Um, as a company, um, we were established, as I mentioned, nine years ago. Uh, we've now lent out uh, to the tune of just over $2 billion in capital across that period of time. Um, we have just under 12,000 active customers and we have a, a very much loved product set. Um, we started the business in, in fixed term loan products and we've evolved the business um, and the product set to include revolving products um, and some payment products and a range of different uh, value added services that our small businesses are looking for. Um, the, the context around the market we operate within is, is also pretty important because the Australian market is very much a small business led economy. Um, there are over 2 million small businesses in Australia. We also operate a business in New Zealand uh, where there are over half a million small businesses um, and they are everywhere. They're in every pocket of the economy. They're in every um, part of, of uh, the industries that we operate within here. And there are very few solutions that work for these small businesses. Um, we'll talk a little bit about our products in a second, but in terms of, um, of our reach, we are a national business across all, uh, all geographical areas, um, and we are continuing to, to work with our customers, looking at how their expectations of product delivery, delivery is evolving, um, and ensuring that we're using technology as the basis of the products that we build and the way that we distribute and, and scale those products into the markets. Now, in terms of, um, of our platform, so I mentioned that the technology really is the, the bedrock of our business. And when we think about the products that we're building and the way we're designing those solutions, it is very much about a technology led approach. Um, we, we built the business in the cloud when we started. Um, there was no such thing as fintech, but um, we certainly were, were looking at how we can use technology to enable financial products and make them much easier um, and more compelling for small business owners. Um, and you can see on this slide here, I won't go through it in, in grand detail, but uh, we do have a number of different products. Um, they are digital oriented products for, for small businesses. We have loan products from $5,000 to $300,000, um, all the way up to three years. We have revolving line products. 
um, up they go up to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And these products also have the ability to make payments. So within our, our revolving line products, for example, a customer via the portal or their app can make a payment. Um, they can use BPay. There's a whole range of different services um, that are again high value add uh, products for that customer. I mean, in, in the New Zealand market, we've now been operating there for three years. Um, we took a lot of the learnings from the Australian market and we leveraged our platform and were able to launch into the, the New Zealand market uh, in a, a very speedy period of time. Uh, and we've now surpassed 150 million in originations over there in that market. So pretty excited about the, the growth prospects, both in Australia and also in New Zealand and our ability to take our products and look more holistically where they can go. I touched a little bit on the um, size of the market that we operate within. We, we do see a very, very large market, but the impact we have uh, and really what gives us purpose as a business um, is, is every bit as important. We know that when we lend money to small businesses, the government knows this, the, the you know, general commentators across the market know this, it has a positive economic impact. And we've been able to quantify that impact um, that when we look at the volume of lending we've done to the tune of, of just over $2 billion, the economic impact of that is north of $7 billion in a positive impact to GDP. And it has created or maintained over 100,000 jobs in the Australian and New Zealand economies. So these are very meaningful things. They give us a lot of purpose as a company uh, and it gives us and, and our investors and our, our team a wonderful um, sense of contribution to what we're building here as a, a company. Um, when we look at the use of funds, um, I'm sure many joining um, here may be, be running your own business or you have friends and family um, that run your own business. Um, you, you know what it's like, right? You need cash to do every activity in a business, whether it's hiring staff, buying equipment, taking advantage of that deal for an inventory that's at a discount. Um, it can be opening a new location. It can be expanding uh, by buying another business. There's a whole range of different reasons why uh, business owners require capital and we wanted to build products that were, were unique and were able to um, to operate uh, for the vast majority of business uses right across the markets we operate in. And in terms of our, our capabilities as a business, we're very focused on, on four main areas. Um, I've spoken a lot about technology and what really underpins our technology is not just the way we think about and design our products, uh, but it's also the data and the depth of data that we have access to. Um, we have well over 100,000 application sets. Every data um, application set has 450 plus data points. Um, and we also have now a history of lending out over $2 billion across a variety of economic um, environments, including the last um, 12 or 18 months of, of the COVID pandemic. Um, we use that data and we use that technology to make more informed choices about the risk we take, the markets we, we operate within and the products that we design. We also distribute our products across a multi-channel strategy. Um, that gives us a, a very low risk in the sense of concentration risk. We have a, a very broad reach. Uh, we we distribute our products directly to customers, which represents about a quarter of all customer flow. And we also distribute through third party partners um, and as you can see here, 10,000 of them across the, the markets we operate within. We also have funding um, and, and very um, constructive and, and productive funding. We've, we've spent a lot of time building this new asset class. We've had to fund that class. Um, we've had to do very, um, very much Australian first and in some cases world first things in this space. Um, and that gives us a real advantage in terms of taking products into market and scaling those products. Uh, which is the final point of our, our capabilities here. We spend a lot of time thinking about how we build operating scale within all of the things that we do. Uh, Prosper is definitely a, a growth investment company. We are looking at how we can continue to invest in our business and grow um, our revenue and our customer reach. Um, so we're not afraid to, to make smart investment choices in that regard. Um, and we do at the same time, though, think a lot about scale and how we generate scale and the activities and the choices we do, particularly when it comes to product design and using technology to power those, those products. Great, so I'm gonna to pass to Ross now for a couple of minutes, um, just to give a, a quick highlights around our financial um, performance and, and how we really look at the numbers in a bit more detail. So Ross, over to you, mate. Thanks, Bo. Um, just following on from what Bo mentioned, uh, the scalability of this business, I think is really reflective on the, uh, the the information on this page. 
you know, obviously during the midst of, of the pandemic, we, like a lot of businesses, decided to scale right back. We, we pretty much turned off our origination faucet um, and really tried to, to understand what the economic effects of the pandemic were gonna be like. As a result, we also cut our um, expense base back considerably as well. So, the, you know, the variability of the costs and the uh, um, and originations was very much key for us at that point. Um, as we as we worked through um, the various quarters, particularly from uh, the first quarter of, uh, of our financial year 21, we really re-ramped up our origination, and you can see that through the through the growth that we. Uh, we wrote and can, this continued all the way through to the final quarter, which was really our record quarter um, that we ever have had, um, showing how quickly we can, we can scale this business back up. Now we did take into account some government guarantee loans, but that was primarily in the, uh, in the first quarter of the second quarter of, of the financial year. Um, and as a result of that, we've we've seen our average gross loans grow considerably, uh, north of uh, you know in total basis almost to four hundred million. So very much back to the pre-pandemic levels uh, that that we were experiencing. Um, you know the other point is that impairments and funding costs also were were very ma were managed very very carefully. Um, our losses were were sort of well within our um, our expectations over that period. So moving to, to credit losses and the performance, I mean, it, I think the key point here is that we have a board mandated risk appetite of four to 6% in terms of losses on, on each cohort that we write. And we haven't gone over that and that's, you know, very much a reflection of the data-driven insights that we have and the ability for us to uh, use our credit decisioning in such a way that we are getting the right outcomes. Uh, and this is, you know, born through you know, possibly the, the biggest stress, I think, that any uh, lender to small businesses could ever experience. I don't think you could have written a, a stress test like the one we've just experienced over the last year. Our loss rates, you know, very much uh, are at, at very low levels, particularly at 90 days plus past due. And we have seen a reduction in our provision. Uh, we announced that last week when we released our, our quarterly update. Uh, that's been really a steady reduction from the, the overlay that we put in place uh, at the end of financial year last uh, of uh, 2020. And you know, you've seen that reduce from 11.1 .1 down to 7.9, reflecting the, the comfort that we have in terms of our loan book and uh, the provisioning that we've got, providing a, you know, quite a stable, even despite that reduction, that's still higher than we would have had pre-pandemic. As Bo mentioned, funding remains one of our, one of our core strengths and the ability for us to have significant funding um, facilities available to us and undrawn capabilities as well. And so, um, you know, from a, from a cash perspective, we hold, um, you know, quite a lot of, uh, of capacity in, in 90, of, uh, we've got 40 million of cash in unrestricted cash. And we have about 97 million of, of undrawn capacity. We also have, you know, the ability to um, look at the ABS market, the term market as well, and that will provide us with further flexibility in our funding. And we should continue to see, you know, the, the ability for us to manage our cost of funds and our ability to, to grow our business with these uh, funding facilities in place. Just gonna hand you back over to Bo. Um, who's going to complete uh, with the over the forward-looking outlook? Yeah, fantastic. Thanks for that, uh, that Ross. So, um, just a couple other um, uh, pages here to share with you, and then uh, happy to take uh, some questions. So, 
Um, in terms of, of what's next for us as a company, um, you know, obviously for us, you know, getting through the, the early stages of COVID last year was a very important um, uh, foundation step for us. And really for the last um, nine to 12 months, uh, we've seen a, a very strong and steady recovery across the economy and the markets we operate within. And even this most recent um, experience in, in lockdowns across uh, New South Wales and, and Victoria, um, yeah, we've seen a, a very different pattern of behaviour. Small business owners are definitely resilient. We've seen the way that they operate and they think um, through these crises and these moments of, of lockdown. Um, you know, to, to date, um, we've seen sort of circa 200 odd um, of, of nearly 12,000 customers request any form of relief um, in the most recent lockdown. So um, we are in a, a really good position. Um, we've got a lot of confidence about how small business owners are thinking and reacting. And we also know that we need to support them that if uh, there is a business out there um, that's got an opportunity and, and needs some funding, then we're going to be there to support them. If there's a business out there that's had their, their doors closed for six weeks because of a government mandate lockdown, we'll support them. Um, so for us uh, as a company, we're really thinking um, big picture and long-term in three phases. Uh, foundations are, are phase one. That's very much oriented around strengthening our core, um, our existing products, uh, obviously uh, we're in well demand and, and high demand across the markets we operate. Um, we are gonna continue to invest in our technology platform and enable our, our product teams in particular to design and, and launch uh, more innovative and more interesting products for our customers. Um, we're then gonna look at how we accelerate um, into to our customer and product innovation. Uh, we, we know that our customers have got a lot of different problems. They've got a lot of different pain points that we wanna help them solve. Um, small business owners uh, are everywhere um, and we really wanna connect with them in meaningful ways and in, in increasingly more meaningful ways than just being a credit partner. Uh, we definitely see ourselves moving into the, the running of a business and the payment side of a business in a, a much more meaningful way um, in the near future. And then ultimately, we want to expand. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Prosper is a growth-oriented business. Uh, we want to continue to leverage our data. We want to think about our distribution and our reach across uh, Australia and New Zealand and, and possibly markets beyond that in the future. Um, for us, it's really about building scaled products, propositions that are, are meaningful and sticky uh, to small business owners. Um, and we believe that in the long run, that's going to create a, a highly valuable business. Um, in terms of, of uh, just a little bit um, more immediate looking, um, we do believe that as a company, we have a, a very highly scalable business. Um, the financial position we're in is going to support us um, through the, the economic cycle. Uh, as Ross mentioned, yeah, we saw probably the toughest conditions last year, around this time, in fact, last year for small business owners. Uh, we've got a huge amount of data from that. Um, and we've, we've come through that in a very strong financial position. Uh, the business model has been tested and we're going to continue to improve and invest um, in the business model, the things that make us really uh, differentiated and, and leaders in the markets we operate. Um, we are going to continue with our funding platform. We think that, um, again, that the cost of capital, uh, whilst it's come down materially over the last three years, we think there is room um, to continue improving that um, as our business gets bigger, as the, the asset class becomes more known and, and recognised to the market and importantly tested through through tough times. Um, we do think there are, are, are going to be opportunities uh, in the near future around that. Um, and we also are looking at our, our customer propositions and, and ensuring that those relationships we have are strengthened. Um, in the last uh, quarter, we saw over 50% of our originations come from our existing customer base. Um, that's, that's quite a, a big milestone for us as a company because existing customers are a sustainable um, source of income for us. Um, they are also cheaper, much cheaper in terms of a cost of renewal than a cost to acquire. Um, and the fact that we've got a very high retention rate um, and revolving products like our line of credit products just give us a lot of confidence again around the sustainability of our, our future financial outcomes. And then finally, um, in terms of, of priorities, so um, yeah, just to round out the, the sort of you know, short term for us, um, we want to be the, the number one and maintain that leadership um, in the Australian and New Zealand markets. Uh, we think there's a lot of benefits from being the, the biggest. We think there's a lot of, of scale benefits from being able to, to maintain and enhance that leading uh, proposition um, in the Australian and New Zealand markets. Um, and we are seeing an economic recovery, again, notwithstanding the most recent lockdowns, 
Um, we are seeing a, a very strong economic recovery across the, the small business community. Um, small business owners have been able to adapt. They've been able to, to orient their businesses to take advantage of new opportunities um, and also take advantage of, of different business models. Um, and just to share an example of that, you know, we've seen multiple retailers um, who have had to move their businesses last year from being a physical shop to being a physical and a digital location. And their digital locations are often now trading at higher levels than their physical retail location ever was. So that's the kind of customer we want to fund. They might need to get warehousing. They might need to get inventory and stock and a whole range of different things. These are the types of, of scenarios that we fund. Um, and we're going to continue to do that across the, um, the different segments of the economy we operate within. Um, finally, just on the growth investment side, I did mention we are um, an, in an investment phase. We're going to continue to, to double down and invest, uh, particularly in our product and engineering, software engineering capabilities. Um, we think that the best companies in the world are, are really technology-led product organisations. Um, and we want to be a, a market-leading um, SME provider that supports a whole range of different product categories for our small business customers in those pillars of grow, running and paying. So hopefully that gives you some, some really good context to, to kind of who we are as a business, um, a little bit of background to, um, to where we've come from and, and where we think we're going. Um, we're happy now to, to open up to any, any questions uh, that we can obviously answer at this point. Thanks, Bo. Thanks, uh, Ross. Um, uh, again, I've got one or two, like the last presenter that was emailed ahead of time. So I'll just uh, get those. Uh, in now before we get a hopefully a few from the audience in terms of the go to market I think you mentioned both as 25% is uh, direct through your own sales channels and 75% roughly through distributors um, are you looking to change that mix materially to be in control of more the, the sales yourself or are you happy with where that mix sits currently uh, look, it's it's a good question. I mean, from our perspective, um, a lot of small business transactions take place um, through third parties. That's just the nature of, of B2B. So, um, you know, for us, we, we started the business indirect and um, so once upon a time it was 100%. It has averaged out around about that, that sort of 23, 25, 27%. Um, kind of range for the better part of seven years, to be honest. So we don't think that that's going to change. And both um, sources of business for us have been growing. So um, it's not just uh, one part, one pocket that's been growing. We've seen our, our direct and our partnership channel uh, business units grow. So we're very comfortable um, with that mix. We think it's, um, it's good to have diversified sources of customers. I think it's important to acknowledge that many small business owners will go to a trusted source um, of advice before they'll jump online or, or respond to you know, perhaps some, some marketing activity. Uh, a good example of that is accountants, um, commercial finance brokers, um, loan comparison websites. There's a whole range of different locations um, that are, are third parties. Um, we we want to ensure that we have the best propositions and that those propositions are um, where the customer is shopping, where they're going when they're looking for, for access to capital. Um, and that's a, a very important part of our, our strategy. So we think we're going to continue to, to have a very large direct business. We'll have a very large partnerships business. Um, and even in new markets like New Zealand, where we launched, we saw um, quite, quite similar um, sorts of percentages um, emerge. So it gives us, again, confidence to invest in both parts of that, the business. Okay. And then the second question was, I think it's around the expand strategy. Are there any plans to move from the i guess sme market up into maybe the mid market space where the the ticket sizes are a bit bigger um we do uh, provide loan facilities um although we don't market it we do provide it up to five hundred thousand dollars once you get to that sort of um half a million to say five million dollar category you do start to bump into more of the bank's products um, so for us, we want to ensure that we are uh, very clear on who our market is, um, how we can um, operate in, in niche parts of the market that happen to be very large um, markets. We, we think the, the unserviced part of the, the S of SME market is somewhere to the tune of $20 billion a year um, in unmet demand. So it is a very big market. Um, and again, the, the, we want to play to our strengths. We want to do things that we can do that are very difficult 
um, to replicate them. And again, once you start getting into you know one million, two million, three million dollar kinds of of business loan facilities, you start entering secured territory. You start having to understand asset valuations. Um, the the customer application flow gets very slow. Um, as you can imagine, it's very difficult. Um, in fact, I would, I would argue almost impossible to provide a two million dollar business loan online and um, do that in a, a sort of you know, one hour turnaround time. That would be be quite a, a risky proposition. So there is a, a range of things that that mid market um, has that doesn't really play to our strengths as a, a company. Um, our sweet spot um, loan and, and line of credit is somewhere around thirty to forty thousand dollars, just to put it in perspective. So. Um, we like the, the small ticket space. Um, we think that's where we can build really innovative products, sticky products, products that small business owners uh, will have unique value in. And we've also built a, an acquisition capability. You know, going and finding um, thousands and tens of thousands of small business owners uh, is a, a skill unto itself. Um, if you actually look at the number of businesses that are in that kind of um, mid-market category, you might have a total addressable market of, of 40 or 50,000 businesses. Um, in our space, we have an addressable market of, of potentially millions of businesses. So we prefer this, this part of the market and, and at least for the foreseeable future, we'll be sticking to this part. Okay, and we've got, well, it's quite a long question from the audience there, Bo. I don't know if you want to pull up the Q&A uh, thing probably. there. It's actually a two-part question. I think it's easier maybe for you to read it than for me to, to call it out. Uh, so if you want to take That's that in the, in the various... Uh, component parts would be great yeah that's fine there's probably a couple we can um we can uh cover off the, the cost of funding is around about 5.7 percent uh, so yeah. that gives you an idea there of every 100 million um, our cost of funds is there um level of originations um we just released our our quarterly um report last week um so you can definitely find that online and they'll have a lot of information there around uh, levels of originations but um, we saw just uh, just over two, 182 million for the last quarter. Um, so again, jump onto the the Prosper um, Investor Portal and, and our full quarterly breakdown. We'll go into that in a bit more detail, but you can see the trajectory um, there. Worth noting that Q4 for us is also end of financial year, so there is a natural surge that we see in um, in May and June, and uh, this year was was fantastic to see that small business um, uh, demand. Um, I'll touch on the recent lockdowns, and I'll come back to the competitive landscape. The recent lockdowns. Um, as I mentioned, we've seen about uh, just, just over 200 uh, requests for, for relief. Uh, represents around about one and a half um, to 2% of all active customers. And what we saw in the, the first um, round of lockdowns last year, and also the Victorian lockdown at the end of last year, we've seen uh, New Zealand um, again going to lockdown at various periods. Um, what we've seen is that the vast majority of customers get back on track um, as soon as the economy opens up. Um, last year, we saw well over 85% of all customers we provided any hardship support to um, get back on their feet, get back to full payments and, and or pay out their, their products in full. Um, so we, we've taken a, a lens, uh, we have a hardship um, uh, policy in place. We'll work with businesses that are impacted, but it's been very small numbers um, at this point. And um, you know, the, the, um, the best way we're thinking of it is that you know, we, we've got to look through these hard um, sort of lockdowns. Um, businesses have got to look through them. And there's a lot of noise in the media, um, obviously, and, and it is hard to see businesses closed. But um, you know, we've also taken last year to really orient our portfolio in a way that's, that we think can trade through really any, any kind of circumstances. And then just quickly to touch on the competitive landscape, which is the first part of that question. Um, there are a number of different um, buckets of competition that we think about. So there are um, sort of lookalike categories of businesses. So people who have built models very similar um, we're trying to build models very similar to Prosper. We keep an eye on those those businesses, um, but the the market we've seen is is definitely um, liking and leading with the, the Prosper propositions. Um, and from a, a scale and reach perspective, it does give us some unique advantages in the way that we can distribute our products, the way we can price our products, the way that we can uh, provide benefits to distribution partners, etc. Um, so we keep an eye on that, that category, but, um, but there's, there's not a lot that worries us in that. There's also the banks. That's the second category. Um, the banks have all now pretty much got a, a replicated product of our, our small business loan. Um, you know, NAB, for example, launched a product QuickBiz six years ago, um, and we still see a very similar percentage of our customers coming from NAB. So again, it tells us that there are some structural challenges that the banks face in regards to servicing small business owners, particularly the, the smaller end of of the small businesses, those doing less than two million a year in revenue. 
Um, and then the third category is the, the technology company. So um, a lot of the technology platforms like PayPal and Amazon and Square have all built working capital products. And these are closed system products. They're, they're offering that capital within their network of, of customers. Um, so that's definitely something we keep an eye on. And when we think about our, our strategy and how important it is that we become and are meaningful to our customers, that drives a lot of our thinking in regards to how we should design our products and how we should service our customers. So hopefully that gives you a, a bit of an idea around the competitive landscape. Yeah, thanks, but that was uh, great. Uh, and I see Michael has said uh, as much. Um, if I can just quickly ask uh, uh, one more question. In terms of the renewal rates, you, you called it out in the presentation that it's up over 50%. Have you got a, a short term or even medium term target where you, you, you obviously, you know, 100% real ideal, but like one where you're kind of uh, targeting internally maybe? And is there a difference in the renewal rates you're seeing via direct uh, and the distribution uh, partners? Uh, so the renewal rate, just to clarify, the 50 um, or 52 percent is the percentage of our originations that's come from uh, existing customers. And it was a big milestone for us because, um, you know, passing through sort of half of our originations coming from existing customers, that's been something we've been working towards for many, many years. Uh, as a company, um, and for obvious reasons, you know, the, uh, an existing customer is known to the business, we have a risk profile, um, we were able to generate that, that renewal for a lower cost. So as an example, if it comes through a partner, um, we usually pay a, a renewal commission that is half the rate of a new customer. And for a direct customer, there is no, no cost, it's literally just our operating cost to renew that customer. So um, there's no cost of acquisition. So um, we really do, do like it. Um, we actually have a, a very high um, renewal percentage rate. So of customers that come on board, we see um, a retention rate sort of circa 65 to 67%. And so far we've seen on average customers um, renew with us 2.8 times through their lifetime. Um, and for our line of credit products, um, we do think that the lifetime value of that product is gonna be even more meaningful um, again. Um, as a product that sort of sits there, customers continue to use for, for many, many years. So um, yeah, for us, the, the, um, the, there's no particular target around what, what percentage of our business uh, existing customers should make. We wanna see both our new and our existing um, customer reaches grow. We think it's very important to continually acquire new customers. Um, and we think it's continuing uh, just as important to, to renew uh, and work with our existing customers. Um, it also gives us a, a sign of confidence in terms of our products because high renewal rates and, um, and great customer satisfaction, um, yeah, that, that tells us that we're doing something special with our products. And that's really important when it comes down um, to things like the competitive landscape um, because we know that, that in any market, you know, a customer and, and over the years will gravitate towards the best products. So knowing that we've got high retention rates, knowing that we have very high MPSs, we have very high trust pilot scores, these are all very important metrics that give us confidence in that sustainable um, customer relationship for many years to come. Great. Well, we're going to have to leave it there. We're going slightly over time and I'll ask for forgiveness from Sharif when he when he gets on. Uh, thank you very much to, to Bo and indeed to Ross as well for the presentation. And I think Ross was sharing the presentation. Ross, if you could stop sharing and uh, we'll get Sharif to start sharing his. Wonderful. Thanks very much, everyone. I'll drop off now. I can see the cover slide of your presentation now, Sharif. Good morning. Good morning. Sharif, uh, is there? I'm, we... I'm in your hands. Um, I'm ready to start uh, whenever you give yep. me the green light. I'm giving you the green light now, Sharif. I can see the cover slide, so you're ready to go. 
Fantastic. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, I'm Sharif, I'm the Managing Director of Drop Suite. A uh, quick introduction about myself. I used to be the, fir the founder, uh, the, the first investor in the company. Um, prior to that, my experience was working in more multinationals. So my first job was at Dell, uh, North America and Asia. And then I moved to Google while I was one of the founding mem members of Google Asia Pacific out of Singapore. And that's when I really caught the startup bug and, uh, and I really was able to grasp the power of building scalable software. Um, let me introduce Drop Suite uh, to, to the attendees first from, from a high level. We are a cloud backup company. We are partner centric, it means we go through partners, we build secure, scalable, highly usable cloud backup technologies for businesses. Uh, our mission is to safeguard business information and to help businesses really stay out of bus in, in business. 100% um, SaaS scalable revenue model. Uh, we've been validated for two years in a row as the email backup leader for uh, specifically around Microsoft Office 365, uh, predominantly focused on the small and medium businesses. We are very, very global. Uh, we have, uh, we've crossed 500,000 users in more than 100 countries. Uh, we have a strong uh, committed team uh, that is being distributed even pr prior to COVID. Uh, across Asia Pacific, North America, and Europe. Uh, it's definitely worth spending a couple of minutes covering the, the industry itself. Uh, the industry itself is growing at a very healthy rate of a CAGR of 24% all the way until 2025. This is the global data backup and recovery market. There are some very meaningful tailwinds propelling this growth. I'm sure you've heard tons of stories about cybersecurity threats, data loss, ransomware, which is which is happening at an alarming rate. Um, and if you really think about what is a company's best resort uh, when it comes to a ransomware event, where basically a cyber criminal will will hold the data hostage and would delete it if they're not paid a couple of bitcoins or more depending on the size of the company, when you have a, a backup that's completely segregated from, from your company's data that's encrypted and is recoverable, that means you can restore your data, that is absolutely the number one protection against data loss. The other one, the other tailwind that's worth talking about is data privacy regulation. This started in, the, in Europe with uh, something called GDPR where data is supposed to be encrypted, it's supposed to be protected, it's supposed to be discoverable as well. Uh, that, that has been a very uh, uh, also meaningful trend in terms of driving our business in Europe. And we're seeing more scrutiny and more regulation happening in other parts of the world, including Singapore, Australia, Brazil, and some states in the US like California. And the third one, and I'm sure you've heard uh, about the, the, the insane migration of data from on-premise to, to the cloud. And just to uh, give here one meaningful and relevant example, uh, if you look at Microsoft Office 365, which is the email and productivity suite of products that uh, Microsoft offers, um, in 2017, they had uh, about 70 million users. In um, early 2021, they announced they exceeded 300 million users. And this is just one example of the, of the crazy uh, numbers that we're talking about here when it comes to migrating data to the cloud. Now, as you migrate data to the cloud, you need another breed of data protection and another breed of the backup companies. And, and that's who we are uh, as, as Drop Suite. So the bottom line here, this is a, a massive market, tailwinds expected to continue for the next, for, for, for the next few years, for the foreseeable future. Um, and then we're, we're, we're also playing in a, in a big amount of white space, it means that there's a lot of companies, especially in the SMBs, uh, about 85% of companies that still do not have proper data backup and data protection to for their companies. Uh, let me explain the, the, the product suite that we have very quickly. Uh, our origins was a website and database backup company. We still have that product. And then we evolved over the years into email backup, then we introduced uh, Microsoft uh, legacy exchange backup a few years back. 
And then in the last uh, two, two, three years, we introduced Microsoft 365 backup and archiving. And then most recently, we also introduced the same for Google Workspace. Google Workspace is uh, Google's uh, response or answer to Microsoft 365. And then when, what we offer in terms of capabilities is a fully automated backup. You, you, you know, it, it takes one or two minutes to, to be set up. Uh, one click restore, so you can restore anything you want from a single email or a single file uh, all the way to the full uh, set of data for a company or for a, for a, for a company employee. We allow comp companies also to download their data and migrate it if they need to somewhere else. Uh, we have by far the best search capabilities, um, uh, especially in the SMB space. Uh, we, we have, it's lightning fast, extremely detailed and nuanced. And, and we have our partners and customers really raving about our advanced search capabilities. What we've done also is that we're not just a backup company. We also cater to regulated industries when it comes to uh, archiving and compliance. We also introduced a GDPR data privacy module, especially for our European partners as well. So as you can see, our product has been evolving in the last um, uh, years from a basic website backup all the way to a, a, a very complete product uh, backup and archiving for the, the cloud uh, solutions from Microsoft and Google. And we're also coupling backup with compliance. So you, you, you can use our products, not just for your business continuity and to, to protect your data, but you're also using our products. You can use your, our product for, for, you know, for giving them access to lawyers and compliance officers in case of a, there's a lawsuit or if there's a regulated query as well. So we cater to, to both these possibilities. Um, I think it's also very important to cover how we uh, sell the product, what's our business model. Um, ever since I uh, took over the company uh, in the end of 2013, 2014, uh, when, when we, we were just almost, I mean, we just had like 200 customers at that time and, and maybe eight employees. Um, I realized that it was absolutely critical to, to move to, into a partner-led model that is highly scalable um, and enables us to reach um, hundreds of thousands and millions of small and medium businesses at scale without having to invest um, a, a high amounts of money in terms of support, sales, and marketing. So we focus on building the high quality products, like for example, uh, about two thirds of our team are in engineering and product, and it enables us to, re to really reach operational leverage very, very quickly. So today, uh, and this is June quarter, 2021, we have about 350 partners uh, across uh, hosting, think of a like a crazy domain in Australia or a GoDaddy in the US and other places, IT distributor partners, uh, I would, an example would be like leader computer in, in Australia or Dicker Data, would be an example of an IT distributor. And then many service providers, and those are the service providers where SMBs and some mid-enterprise customers, clients, they tend to outsource their IT needs to. Uh, and though there, there's about uh, at least two to 300,000 many service providers in, in the world. And, and I'm only talking about OECD countries like North America, Japan, Australia, Europe, et cetera. Now, when we talk about 350 uh, IT reseller partners, we are only talking about the partners that we have signed a contract with, uh, with and we are billing on a monthly basis. They are revenue generating. Uh, but in addition to those, we also have north of 1,500 MSP partners that are buying our services and are being billed by our IT distribution partners in uh, all around the world. So we, we're talking about close to about 2,000 partners transacting with us. And this is generating uh, about 520,000 users. This is this is June uh, numbers, and this ranges from micro businesses, one to five employees, all all the way to to the lower part of the to the uh, of enterprise to a few thousand employees per end client. So we have a very wide range of of partners, and we have a very wide range of customer segments as well. What, how do we derive our advantage in the marketplace? Uh, the, the, the first and foremost, we focus on delivering the most seamless partner integration. And what I mean by that um, is we, uh, we have been embedding our software into the ERP systems and into the workflows of our partners. 
So billing, provisioning, supporting, using the product, everything is happening from within the existing workflow of the partner and they're managing multiple solutions on behalf of their clients. That is number one. Now, if you think about two sides of a coin, the other side of the coin is we deliver an exceptional user experience. Um, I mentioned about how we are very unique in combining backup and archiving into one product. That's very unique in the marketplace. We have absolutely the best search capabilities uh, when it comes to sifting through you know, millions of emails possibly to find what you're looking for in case of a regulator query or in, in case you lost something that you need for a customer. Uh, we also have highly granular restoration capabilities, which is also very unique and special, especially in the SLB space. And as you can see here on the right-hand side, we're really up to the right in, in, uh, in, in this quadrant that's being done by uh, a well-known company called uh, Infotech. And they do, they've been doing software reviews since the late 80s. Um, and I'm really, very pleased to see that the results have been consistent uh, in, in the two years that they've started doing the quadrant on, on email and uh, productivity backup. The other really great thing about the software reviews is they go deep into not just the, the features and capabilities, but they also measure a, sort of, a, of an emotional component to what we offer. So here you can see, this is again, third party uh, equal playing field for all the people, the, the vendors that are on the quadrant. You can see that we offer things like unique features and security and, and things like this. But we also have, a, there's a very high emotional uh, you know, component to it. So when you look at love, integrity, generosity, trustworthy, friendly, fair, uh, continuously improving. And that has resulted in us being in the top right-hand side of the quadrant, as I mentioned. And then if you look at the lower part of this, 97% of those surveys were likely to recommend, 100% plan to renew. And that's reflected in our churn numbers, which we'll cover later. And then 87% satisfied with the cost to value, keeping, keeping in mind that we are on the upper end in terms of uh, pricing versus the competition. And that gives us a, a leading uh, score of 9.3 over 10. Uh, now, how do we look at our business and what are the, the main growth pillars of the business? Um, I did mention that uh, continuous product innovation and improvement is, is a big part of who we are and what we do. I mentioned how we have two thirds of the team are in engineering and product. Uh, this is something that uh, is a main focus for us. Our latest uh, introductions was uh, the, the complete Google Workspace backup and archiving solution. We also introduced a new partner, partner dashboard. So basically our, our portal to allow partners to really um, you know, benefit from, from running their business in, in the most seamless way possible. And that's partner portal is integrated, as I mentioned, into their ERPs. We have introduced a new one as we scale, add more partners and add more users. We felt that's what, that was necessary to do. We are, uh, and will continue to be very, very partner focused. So we have, uh, as I mentioned, we have close to 2000 partners overall that's growing at a very rapid clip. Um, and uh, and we, we also expect more strategic partners to be onboarding with us in the second half of calendar 2021. And then the third component of the growth is to continue diversifying our revenue streams and also boosting our average revenue per user. And that's something we'll, we'll cover uh, in the coming slides. So again, to just summarize, you know, we're this fast growing company working in a massive addressable market with a lot of white space remaining. The market itself has quite a bit of tailwinds and that is really translating well into our results. This is, this is the quarter on quarter numbers. So we hit 11 million um, ARR in June. Uh, our average revenue per user, that's 15% quarter on quarter and 80% and plus year on year. The average revenue per user also increased by 5%. Uh, uh, quarter on quarter and close to 20% uh, uh, month uh, year on year. We're almost at uh, cash flow break even at uh, you know negative uh, $20,000 burn in, in the June quarter. Uh, and then given that our business is based on, on partners and we tend to invoice them at the end of the month and then they charge us and then we, they pay us like 30 or 60 days later, we're already EBITDA positive. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the, the partners grew by, uh, the, the, that we signed the contract with grew by 12% um, 
court, uh, quarter and quarter, but we saw a lot more growth also in terms of numbers when it comes to the partners buying through our IT distribution partners. Uh, we continue to grow our end users and we're in a decent cash position and we've told the market repeatedly that we don't have any intention to raise money for any organic purposes. When it comes to the cash flow, as, as you see, we're, we're at, at or almost at uh, cash break even. Uh, we, uh, as probably, as you all know, once a SaaS company growing at the rate of growth that we're growing, once we hit a positive cash generation um, and profitability, uh, the, the, really the pendulum sw uh, swings the other way. But what we have been very clear on is that we do not uh, expect to become a dividend paying company in the next two to three years. Instead, we have full intention of reinvesting back a, a good chunk of that profit and cash back into growing the business. Um, so th this is the uh, year on year uh, you know, metrics uh, on, on some other interesting components as well. So the top 10 revenue contribution, and again, I'm, I'm talking about the top 10 of the, three, the, of the 350, not of the 2000, uh, reduced by, by three percentage points to 68%. We have a very stable and very low uh, partner churn at uh, sub 3%. I mentioned about ARPU growing close to 20% year on year, driven by the fact that our fastest growing products happen to also be the highest revenue per user and the highest feature product like Office 365 backup. And then we see tremendous um, uh, amount of users, especially in North America, going for the highest price product, which is backup plus the archiving product combined. And that's been uh, driving our output to grow at a very healthy clip. And then you can see that our end users grew at 51% year on year. Um, on the right hand side, you can see that, uh, that we I mean, we obviously as a company, you have your ups and downs, but if you take the average, the Kager for the for the for the last uh, five, six years, it's it's in the 76%. And if you look at the year on year of June 2021 versus June 2020, uh, we grew in US dollars where we derive majority of our revenue, we grew by by 80%. Um, in terms of outlook, uh, there's a couple of things. One is to really focus first on the year of 2021 calendar, which we are in right now. We have set from the beginning of the year to double down on what we have, rather than to try to, to, to build or chase other, other, other opportunities because we, we strongly felt and continue to feel that this is a massive addressable market and we wanted to double down on it in 2021. So the, the, the flavor of the year, uh, of 2021 is to really be the single vendor story or the one-stop shop for our partners, right? So any platform that they have for their clients, Microsoft, uh, Google, legacy, doesn't matter. We offer a backup and archiving solution for any email and productivity platform, number one. Number two, we are present and have data centers using Amazon Web Services across all geographic locations that we're focused on. As I mentioned, we're really focused on OECD countries and we have 14 data centers around the world. The, the, the third one, and we've been getting more inroads into the enterprise space. So being able to appeal to end clients, uh, businesses from one employee all the way to thousands of employees. And we can do that today. And the third one is to be able to cater to every single vertical out there, healthcare, which is regulated D2 for financial. And most recently we have also launched a government, US government data center in Virginia, uh, USA. So we can also cater in the coming few months to uh, the federal government in the US and also any vendor working with the, with the federal government. So what we're doing right now is getting the certifications uh, for, uh, for things like SOC 2-2, which is very big in the enterprise space, getting something called uh, FedRAMP for, for the federal government. We're, all, we're already certified for healthcare with HIPAA and GDPR, as I mentioned, data privacy laws in the EU. And we're also certified with FINRA, which is another financial certification. So we're ticking all these boxes. And, and, and you can see that as we increase our appeal with all the segments, all the verticals, all geographies, and all platforms, we, we, we're very bullish about our future and what's to come. Uh, so in terms of outlook, uh, as, as I just alluded to, strong ARR growth and user growth expected to continue. We've been executing really well. 
solid tailwinds in the industry, as we mentioned earlier, the, the, the market is structurally growing itself. Um, we'll continue investing in bench strength, the people, and sales and marketing programs um, in the foreseeable future. Uh, we believe we are, uh, we're well funded for organic growth. So even though, you know, I mean, for a company above $100 million valuation, some people would argue, like, you only have $2.4 million in cash. But as, as I'm, I'm sure all of you are sophisticated investors, but as you know, as the company gets to cash flow generation and profitability, as I mentioned earlier, the pendulum will switch to the other side. Uh, so we'll continue investing using our, uh, our own cash. However, as we look into expanding our product offerings in the next 18 to 24 months, um, uh, inorganic opportunities, high conviction acquisitions will be on the table. And that's when we will we'll be open for, for possible um, um, capital raises in the future. Uh, but bottom line, um, you know, we're really optimistic about the coming few years. Uh, you know, strong tailwinds across the board, data protection, ransomware issues, um, regulation, all those things are continued, are expected to continue to stay with us for the foreseeable future. Solid execution and team. Uh, the, uh, I made sure every single person in the team uh, is, is, is an owner in the company through LTR, long-term incentives that are very well aligned with the shareholders. Uh, we have a phenomenal culture as a company. Um, and then we, as I mentioned, we just reached uh, close to crash break even and profitability. And we, we see ourselves as becoming more of a, of a backup powerhouse when it comes to all cloud applications. And our theory is very simple. You're seeing companies, big and small, moving all of their SaaS, all of their workloads into, uh, into, into the cloud. Uh, everything is quote unquote SaaSified, and there's going to be continuous need for more data protection across multiple SaaS applications as we go forward. Uh, with this, I uh, conclude my presentation. And I'll, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, keep in mind that I'm also very available. So you can see my email there. I'm happy to reach out. I'm happy to, to respond to any of your questions later if we run out of time today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sharif. Uh, one, we got in ahead of time. Uh, sure. It's in relation, I, I don't know how much visibility you have on it, but uh, it's churn at the at the end user level. Um, you know, what's that? Have you heard back from partners, maybe broadly over the last 12 months with, you know, COVID? What has been the churn like at the, at the user level? Have you had any visibility or feedback on that? Yeah. We don't have it right now, uh, but it's something that we will be looking at. Uh, and I'll tell you why we haven't really prioritized that, because the way we conduct our business with partners is that the majority, uh, the, the, the majority of the end clients do not touch our product. Everything is 100% handled by the partner. Uh, the management, the provisioning, the restore, the search, all of these things. Uh, but I can tell you that we did not see any change in partner churn, which is a proxy, uh, not a perfect proxy, but a proxy for the end user churn during the COVID-19 uh, quarters uh, until today. Okay, great. And then just a question on the acquisition uh, strategy. Uh, is it purely product aligned or is there potential for it to you know, get you into new markets outside of where you're operating um you know maybe more emerging markets for example because i know you you said you're very focused on oecd at the minute uh, this is this is we're looking uh, more for the former we're looking into bolt-on acquisitions as i said we're growing our partner base at a very rapid uh, pace um uh, as i said there's going to be more and more need for SaaS backup uh, protection um, so the focus is to find, uh, identify, and, and when we have high conviction, acquire companies who have solid complementary products that continue fulfilling our mission of safeguarding business information, uh, mostly uh, in OECD countries for the next two to three years. And then the final question is, um, in terms of pricing uh, power, uh, given you know, the state of economies and, you know, a lot of your users are small business users. What's the, 
ability to, to push through price increases on the product via the partners, obviously, to end users, um, given just where everybody is currently after the last 12 to 18 months? Yeah, this is, a, this is a great question. Uh, the way I see it is when you as a small and medium business, and remember right now, we're no longer really playing in a, in a big way in the micro business. So we're talking about solid uh, SMBs between 20 to 500 users, just to be clear. And where, where is our real engine of growth today? Okay, so it's 20 employees all the way to 500. So one of the reasons that we didn't see a lot of churn uh, throughout this painful period, um, in, in my opinion, is when you are a small and medium business, again, 20 to 500, that you are able to afford to have a proper managed service provider taking care of all your, your IT needs, and you're paying them anywhere between 60 US dollars per user per month, all the way up to 120 US dollars, even 150 US dollars per user per month. That means you're a well-established company, right? And you have your cash flow, you have your profit, and you're not like a, a micro business that's, you know, you don't know if you're going to be surviving tomorrow. So those companies are not price sensitive. And as I mentioned, we're growing at 80 plus percent ARR and we are one of the more, uh, we are the pricier uh, vendor in the SMB space today. Uh, so the pricing power is there. However, it is not a lever I want to pull anytime soon given the growth trajectory that we see right now. I mean, right now the focus is really, uh, you know, boosting revenue per user with more uh, SKUs or more capabilities, and also getting more and more of this white space that's available in front of us. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Sharif, for joining us this morning. We're just uh, gone over time slightly. Um, and I know Bernard uh, from Cash Awards has been waiting patiently for us uh, to kick off his presentation. So Sharif, if you could stop sharing your screen. And uh, thank you. And then we will hand over to Bernard to start sharing his. I can see the cover slide of your presentation now, Bernard. So you're good to go whenever you are. Beautiful. Thank you. And thanks, everyone, uh, for joining. We'll talk you through today the overarching or the over, overall business, as well as uh, our most recent results, which were released yesterday. Um, we are Cash Rewards, and we are the clear Australian market leader in the fast-growing but globally proven cashback market. Uh, what, what cashback ecosystems do and, and, and what we do is connect customers and brands. And you can see that we currently do that uh, across some of Australia and the world's leading brands with scale uh, in terms of 1 million members and more than 1,700 brands. What our more than 1 million me members get is real cash savings when they shop with, with those 1,700 brands. So today our members can earn 15% at Nike, 10% at Dyson, 7% at Amazon, and 10% at a range of beauty brands as, as well as thousands of other great savings. And, and that's just a regular Thursday for us. That's why our members love us. Our net promoter score is more than 50, which coming from retailers like, like Woolworths and Meyer, I, I, I appreciate is an incredibly strong score. And we're the highest rated loyalty program on product review at, at, at 4.4 stars. We're able to offer this value to our members because we deliver our brands unrivaled returns on, on their marketing spend. We effectively take what is otherwise wasted advertising spend spend on things like reach or eyeballs and we put it directly in the hands of, of their shopping customers uh, and the brands benefit from zero risk because they don't pay a cent to us unless a member actually transacts so brands where sometimes like google or a facebook but where the brand only plays pays for a transaction versus a click or an impression and where sometimes an alternative to traditional media like television or out of home where the brand obviously pays for um, for eyeballs and with us, they actually pay for a shop. So as an ecosystem, we, we create value across both sides and ultimately our growth is fueled by on one side, getting more members and, and having them shop our offers more often. And this obviously delivers more value to brands, which gets us even more compelling offers, which ultimately supports greater member scale and engagement and around it goes. 
uh, all of this together delivers more sales through our ecosystem and, and ultimately the, the shareholder returns. Uh, it also allows us to support partners like ANZ uh, with whom we've just launched a, a transformational world partnership I'll talk to later. Uh, and it only means more value to members and brands whilst accelerating our scale. So how it actually works when you sign up or if you're a member is you simply join. It's, it's quick, it's simple and it's free and, and you can start searching immediately offers that are routinely like 8% at Apple, for example, or more than 15% at booking.com, more than 20% at, at Wickerland and others. Um, once you have transacted and earned that, that saving, it, it sits in your account and you can withdraw it at any, at any time into your bank or PayPal account. Um, ultimately, you know, it's just traders love saving. They love earning rewards, shopping with brands that they love. And, and the simplest comparison probably is a loyalty program where more than 14 million Australians participate in those to earn rewards on their shopping. But unlike those programs with us, you save across all categories and all brands. And it's, it's real and it's significantly more value. So, with Apple, you can earn more than $150 on a new iPhone versus versus points comparables. Uh, and ultimately you shop now and, and you save now. So for our members, those savings stack up quickly and, and because they can withdraw that cash, it's 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 easy and simple and there's no strings attached. The opportunity for us is to really capitalize on the significant penetration. Uh, of our category in Australia relative to, to very similar geographies. The cashback market is incredibly immature in Australia relative to the US and the UK, where it's six to eight times larger, but its growth is ultimately fueled by accelerated e-commerce growth, as well as it being an irresistible proposition for, for customers. It's only a few years ago that Australians really understood that Buy Now Pay Later offered them with a more flexible and customer friendly way to pay. And now they're discovering that with us, they can earn real cash savings when they shop with no strings attached. And ultimately that's what's driving our greater than 200% member growth. And that's why our members already shop with us more than 11 times in a half, which is really unmatched by any other e-commerce companies and, and growing it at more than 30% as we see more members shop and save with us more often. Our total addressable market opportunity is enormous. There's obviously the six to eight times growth from reaching the penetration of those still growing, but more mature markets. But there's also 20 million Australian shoppers and, and which Australian doesn't love to save. In Australia, obviously there's a unique opportunity in terms of, of the propensity to participate in, in loyalty programs, with more than 14 million Australians doing so. And if you're gonna scan a piece of plastic for, for five cents every hundred dollars, then, then our proposition and the value it creates is a no brainer. Uh, ANZ and the relationship I'll talk about on that front is proof that that the um, proof in the opportunity as as we're effectively offering a tailored version of our proposition to their five million credit and debit card holders, creating the potential for five times growth with with one brand alone uh, with that launch. In, in, in terms of, of how we actually deliver on that that penetration opportunity. Uh, as the ecosystem where we connect shoppers and, and brands and, and with ANZ and others partners to grow each side uh, and accelerate our growth and, and our revenue, that value is created by, as I said, on one side, more member shopping more often and on the other side, more brands getting more value and giving more value to customers. Uh, this means how you judge success and, and our delivery or execution on our strategies ultimately through acquiring new members, through growing our shopping member base and, and through increasing the frequency with which members shop with us. As we do this, it delivers more value for customers and increases their stickiness. Uh, and we'll also see greater returns for our brand, which uh, for our brand partners, which increases our share of their marketing spend and, and increases uh, our gross margin and, and flows through our PL. To do this, we're investing heavily in our product and technology to differentiate, uh, which ultimately is the key to providing more value to members, to brands and partners. And we've called partnerships out as, as a specific opportunity because it's 
it's a significant opportunity for us to scale the size and engagement of our customer base at, at low to no marketing cost. And I'll talk about cash rewards max and, and depending launch of that uh, in that context. So with that strategy, which we've executed against throughout the period since the IPO and obviously in the most recent quarter, we've been able to deliver some, some great results with the quarter. Uh, they show us continuing to, to execute ruthlessly against our strategy and, and as I said, continuing to focus investment towards marketing to, to drive awareness of, of an underpenetrated or, or lack of um, lack of understood category, but also significantly more towards product and technology enhancements to, to drive overall business performance, uh, but also um, to support the launch of strategic partnerships. So in terms of, of acquiring new members, uh, we grew our member base to more than 1.1 million in the fourth quarter, which was up 44% versus the prior calendar period. And, and you know, effectively demonstrates that, that more Australian consumers are embracing the opportunity to, to buy now, save now. In particular, the new member growth of more than 200% that's uh, powered by our, our, our investment in the period. And, and it's really important to, to note or to call out that we're different to other, other businesses in, in that once we've acquired a customer, uh, we don't need to reacquire them. They, they continue to shop and we have the benefit of driving value for them over, over future years with, with the average customer lifetime of, of more than five years. In terms of acquiring new members as well, we launched, um, or sorry, announced the pending launch of, of Cash Rewards Max. Um, that's pursuant to a strategic partnership, um, transformational, transformational with us um, or for us with ANZ Bank. Uh, it, it is effectively uh, us powering loyalty proposition for their 5 million credit and debit card holders. And, and we see that as an enormous opportunity to, to scale our growth and, and are really excited uh, to, to use that uh, to deliver on our, our broader partnership strategy in the, coming, in the coming quarters. In terms of growing our shopping members, as we invested in, in our platform and a suite of member engagement initiatives, we, we also delivered really excellent growth there with, with active members uh, 273,000 shoppers in the period, which is up 40% against the prior calendar period. In terms of growth of, of those shopping members, in addition to Cash Rewards Max, we also executed an agreement um, and, and have launched the product development so that uh, members can use their FPOS card in addition to their Visa and their MasterCard to, to earn cash back in store um, from, um, from early July. Um, and so members are able to avail themselves of that um, immediately. And that's a really exciting uh, development because it, it does allow uh, more members to, to become active and, and remain active. And as I said, the pending launch of Cash Rewards Max, we announced with the, the, the transformational partnership that there was a, a fast path towards an, an additional half a million active members by, by early FY23. Uh, this scale would alone triple our existing member base at, at limited marketing cost and, and we see that and other partnerships as a driver of, of significant growth and accelerated scale for the business. In terms of increasing the frequency with which members shop with us, you can see underlying transactions of, of you know, more than 800,000 was up, was up 47% versus the prior calendar period and total transaction value or sales through the platform was up 50% versus the prior calendar period to, to almost $100 million. This is a really strong result when considered in the context of the significant e-commerce growth in that same period last year during the full COVID lockdown. And, and so it demonstrates that we're growing from and, and beyond um, that step change. Our focus on these three metrics um, helped deliver receipts from customers of more than 6 million in, in the fourth quarter, which was a 41% increase against the prior calendar period. We expect this strong momentum to continue into FY22 with increasing awareness and penetration and, and our product and platform enhancements fueling growth of our relevancy to members, merchants and partners. 
and we'll continue to shift our focus towards investing um, yeah, in that way. Um, across all of these metrics, we were we were really pleased and proud that we we closed cash and cash equivalents at the end of the quarter with more than twenty six million dollars, uh, which is well ahead of, of analyst estimates. And in the coming quarters, we'll obviously continue to execute against our strategy and and demonstrate that exponential growth through focusing on acquiring new members, growing our shopping members, and increasing the frequency with which they shop with us. Uh, we're, we're also incredibly proud of, of how the growth of our business uh, supports and continues to increase our contribution to the Starlight Foundation. 1% uh, of, of every saving or, or reward earned by a member uh, goes back to the foundation. And, and um, we've, we've helped um, to, to contribute close to a million dollars to the foundation since the company's inception. And, and through the growth, in, growth since IPO, we've brought joy to another 15,000 sick children and their families. And so, so we remain as a business committed to that and, and proud of how um, our, our growth contributes to, um, um, to, those, uh, to those families. Um, delighted to, uh, to take questions. Uh, thanks, Bernard. That was great. Um, uh, just a question on the on the ANZ um, partnership. Uh, is that an exclusive partnership? And if so, does it have a, a time limit to when it uh, expires or allows you to potentially pursue a similar white label strategy with, you know, Westpac or Combank or whoever? Yeah, the the the. The, the initial agreement has an initial term of, of three years and um, it, it, it is though a foundational agreement and we talked on the announcement of it to the exciting product innovation we're going to continue to develop with them. Um, what's really exciting is that it's not white label, it's proudly branded Cash Awards Max and, and that as that program operates, um, members of Cash Awards Max are effectively our members and so uh, we benefit from from being able to maintain and build that direct relationship with them. We we talked to limited exclusivity when we announced it, um, and and we talked to that limited exclusivity in the context of um, maintaining a strategic focus on on executing partnerships to support scale. So uh, it's fair to assume that that we maintain flexibility to um, to continue to pursue that as a strategic growth lever. Okay, great. And then in terms of the partnerships with the brands and revenue and margins for your model, obviously the the um, consumers get you know varying discounts um, within the uh, within the ecosystem. But in terms of margin and revenue for you, is there like a fixed? So uh, my question is. Does the size of the discount affect the revenue that uh, flows through to cash rewards the the company? It does, and and we see brands uh, working with us during the course of the year in different ways. As I said, they we are always on, and so we we work as more of a a, a search or performance based marketing channel, um, and then we're also able to link to their campaigns and, and uh, work more, more strategically. Um, the former generally has a lower cash back. The latter generally has a significantly greater um, cash back. Um, through the combination of those throughout the year, whilst they differ by category and brand, our, our average commission um, is, is above 6% and, and we're seeing strong growth in that um, from 5.4% um, in FY20, which is reflective of us uh, taking more marketing spend from brands as, as we deliver those results. Um, and then we obviously give a portion of that um, commission, uh, which is effectively our revenue back to customers. Uh, that is effectively our, our cost of goods sold. Historically, we've given around 70% of, of that back to members. Through our growth phase, um, we've increased that to, to above 80%. Um, reflective of those those three key metrics that we're we're driving in terms of acquiring new members, um, driving increased activity and and ultimately frequency. Um, obviously, as we continue to grow commission uh, going forward, and and with the benefit of scale, we'll look to to um, to bring back that percent that we invest in cogs, which obviously you know drives significant operating leverage as we grow. 
And then an, a, another question would be, I, I know you haven't been listed for 12 months yet, so I'm just trying to get an understanding of, is there any seasonality in the business? Uh, you know, obviously that run into Christmas is very big for, for, for retailers, you know, right across the market. Um, is there is there seasonality on your side as well uh, in terms of, you know, that that pre-Christmas time being a, being a big um uh, revenue quarter or half for for cash rewards yeah absolutely we we do see um seasonality in terms of what is effectively that second quarter for us that's always the biggest quarter of our year Um, that's why we're really excited to launch uh cash rewards max next year as it will give us sorry in august next month um as it will give us the opportunity to really scale both of our um both of our propositions through that key trading period um, generally, quarter one and, and quarter four uh, are relatively similar. Quarter, th- quarter three is, is probably the softer of the four quarters, as you might expect, with, with customers coming off that peak trading period and those, those key retail events across Cyber Weekend and, and Click Frenzy um, into, into the early months of the calendar year. And then expansion possibly into New Zealand because I know a lot of these big international brands would run a you know Australia New Zealand office you know either based out of New Zealand or based out of out of Australia probably Australia more than New Zealand um is 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 that an opportunity or is there kind of an incumbent there that has that market um you know well serviced at this point it, it's an opportunity for sure and it's it's one where when we talk to the transformative nature of the of the ANZ deal, um, there are many facets of that, and one is the potential to to work with them in other markets um, in which they have a, um, a a leadership position. I think in the short term, uh, investors can assume that we're we're really single mindedly focused on the Australian market. That you know, that eight, ten, fourteen x opportunity in in terms of um, of capitalising on the underpenetration that that you know drives significant multiples um, of, of revenue and 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 op- and, and great um, returns over a relatively fixed operating cost base. So uh, Australia is the priority, but but absolutely with with the opportunity to look at um, to look at markets where we can partner with with brands that have a strong presence. And then in terms of brands, uh, I think. Was it thirteen hundred that you mentioned at the at the start of your presentation? How much scope is there to you know get more brands on there? I mean, some of the names that were on the on the slide are you know some of the the, the biggest uh, and uh, by revenue and probably by household name in Australia. Is there is there opportunities out there for still larger other large brands that you haven't got a, a relationship with to to come on to the platform? Absolutely. When when we undertook the IPO, so December last year, we had uh, closer to fourteen um, or fifteen hundred brands on the platform. Um, now we're uh, well above seventeen hundred brands. Um, we're really focusing in the short term on those mass relevant brands, and so quality over quantity, um, which obviously benefits our members in in terms of of um, really relevant and and really compelling offers. Uh, it, it also benefits the business in terms of um, scalability as it relates to not just the customer proposition, but uh, those brands that have um, had have sizable marketing budgets that that can fuel um, our commission and our revenue. So um, that that brand, the brand side of the ecosystem is always important. It, it remains an area of focus in terms of the quality of offers and the quality. Um, of of brands and categories in which we operate, and 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 so um, focused on on growing. But I think the market can assume that that it's it's growing um, with with a prioritisation of, um, as I said, quality over 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 long tail. And then in terms of the the customer base, I'm guessing it's quite uh, let's say millennial kind of sub. 35 maybe sub 40 in nature or are you finding that the membership growth is actually starting to now as you as you get to a a bigger bigger base starting to span uh, maybe a slightly older age group and a slightly wealthier age group 
it's really interesting and, and I think it, it relates back to our confidence around going after you know the the um, entire Australian shopping market or or you know at least the portion that that engage with loyalty programs our, our base actually skews uh, around uh, that sort of 35 to 50 age group um, it skews female um, and it skews significantly higher than than the average Australian in in, in terms of socio-demographic or income. So uh, we, we see that that is an incredibly uh, valuable proposition for brands, obviously, because they're high value, high propensity shoppers. Uh, and, uh, but it remains an underpenetrated um, category in terms of our proposition. So I think, you know, our, our focus will remain on extending our, our penetration of those customers and, and, and really focusing on the customers that matter most for the brands we work with. Okay, great. We're just pushing up on time. If we don't have a question or two from the audience, I think we will leave it there. Bernard, thank you very much for joining us this morning and waiting uh, patiently. I know you were waiting there for a while as we went through the last one or two presenters. Um, and for everyone else, uh, as I said, the recording of this will be up on the YouTube channel tomorrow morning. And our next event is happening also tomorrow morning where we'll have another four uh, companies presenting uh, for their appendix 4c results and uh, so final thanks to bernard and i wish everyone a good rest of their thursday thanks mark have a great weekend anyone and feel free to, to reach out at those details below thanks, great mark. thanks bernard bye cheers everyone